Okay, now the sound is on. So I can repeat myself, it's very easy. I was just saying, welcome all. It is a pleasure to receive you at FLAD uh, uh, for the second session of the cycle Democracy the Way Ahead. For those of you who weren't here at the previous session in January, during 2023, FLAD will bring international experts in politics and international relations to Portugal to discuss with us the challenges that our democracies are facing today, particularly in the transatlantic community. We had a first session in January with John Eikenberry, where we discussed how to make the world safe for democracy, the shortcomings and the achievements of the liberal international order, and what we can do to protect and defend it. The debate on the future of liberal interna internationalism cannot be had without discussing those making the world unsafe for democracy, those who see us as enemies, as the title of this section, session suggests, how they view the world order and how they view us. Constance Telsen Muller, who I'm very happy to receive here at FLAD, is the director of the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution and the inaugural holder of the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and transatlantic relations. Constance is an expert on the European and German foreign policy and on transatlantic relations. She makes the bridge between Europe and Washington. We can say that she explains Europe to the Americans and the United States to the Europeans. The conversation will be moderated by Bruno Cardoso Reis from ISCTE, which I thank for his presence here. And today, Almost one year after Putin's invasion of Ukraine, it is time to think of the profound way in which it has changed our worldview and also our, how we think of ourselves as Europeans and, of course, how it has reinforced the transatlantic alliance. With this cycle, we want to make us aware that our values and the liberal democratic order should not be taken for granted. We want to promote an informed debate on this crucial issue because we believe we all have a part to play in defending our democracies. Doing all our part also means being informed and interested in discussing and participating, participating in forums such as this. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is working. Yeah, you can hear me in the back. Good. Um, I tend to talk very quickly. It's a, an occupational hazard. So uh, if you find me hitting Machtu, um, wave at me or say something. Um, and I will try and slow down again. It's just the way, unfortunately, I work. Um, Rita, thank you very much for this really kind introduction. I have been here since. Um, since when? It's Wednesday today. I've been here since Monday, and I've already had a very exciting two days. Um, really very interesting, full of fascinating meetings um, and conversations. And it's my first time in Lisbon in I don't know how many years, but it's really wonderful um, to now that this pandemic appears to be giving us a break, um, to be able to travel again and to see old friends and. Um, I have realized that one cannot come to Lisbon often enough, so I hope this is only the first time of many. Um, it's also, I have to say, very disturbing to be standing and talking in front of my picture. Um, but I, I gather that can't be turned off, so I apologize to you. Um, but you're just going to try and look at me rather than at that. Um, I am going to, uh, Bruno and I have agreed that I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes, and uh, then he and I will engage in some conversation, some back and forth, and then we will open up for questions from you and hopefully answers from Bruno and me. Um, and if those answers are unsatisfactory, you can always throw something. Um, but the thing I want to do is to speak a little bit about the title of my, uh, the subject that you can see in the, in the title of my talk, The Free World and Its Enemies, What Putin's War and um, China's Global Ambitions Means Been for Us. Um, and yes, that does have something to do with democracy. 
as you will see. Um, but I'm also perfectly happy to answer questions about democracy in the Q&A. I am a constitutional lawyer by training, and once in a very long time, when I was a young person, wrote a doctoral thesis, a German doctoral thesis, about direct democracy in America. So it's something I care about, and I've also written uh, more amounts of my columns in the Financial Times than I care to remember about threats to democracy, either in Germany from the uh, uh, Alternative for Deutschland there, uh, or from sort of nasty things happening in America. So if you have specific questions about that, I can address that too. But for now, I want to sort of focus on, on what this war means for us, if, if you'll let me, and then we'll take it from there. Um, we are living, it seems to me, in one of those very rare historical moments in which a discrete and regional event, Putin's invasion of Ukraine on February 20, 24th of 2022, last year, nearly a year ago, immediately ripples around the world with, at the, as yet, I think, completely unpredictable outcomes and consequences, and becomes the filter through which we assess almost everything else. Certainly, it has become the filter through which I see and organize really almost all of my personal work. And my country, of course, is a key player, a crucial factor in all this, but it's not the middle of the world, although sometimes we certainly sound as though we were. Um, so I'm going to begin elsewhere with the return of war to Europe and what that means for the free world in general, and I will come to my own country at the end. And I will, as think tankers like to do, I will sort of give you an assessment of what I think and ending with an assessment order of what I think we ought to do um, in order to make it easier for you to disagree with me in the, in the discussion. And, and I will, I think, end with some very random thoughts on what this could mean for your country. Um, but I'm going to do that in a highly non-prescriptive way because I don't want to presume, and presumably you have a lot more to tell me than I could possibly tell you, to which I look forward. But let me start with the state of the conflict itself, which is something uh, that I think is on everybody's mind as we near the one-year mark. And I, in fact, um, am flying tomorrow, at least if Lufthansa will let me, um, to Germany to participate in the Munich Security Conference, um, which I think this year should be very exciting. I've been doing this in different ways, first as a journalist and then as a participant for more than 20 years. And I can tell you that the last one, was, which was the weekend before the invasion, was very tense and very glum. And I am actually genuinely looking forward to the debates this time around because um, Zelensky is coming. Um, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, is coming. An unusually large delegation of American United States senators is coming, including uh, a lot of Republicans who apparently feel they need to say something. Uh, including the leader of uh, the, the minority, the minority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell. So I expect this to be an unusually high-level gathering with a lot of theatrics, certainly, but also a lot of lot of very important messaging. On the war itself, we are seeing another potential turning point. I think we saw for a long time a sort of back and forth, and over the the winter, there was an impression that the Ukrainians were slowly gaining ground and the Russians were slowly losing ground. And what we're seeing now is not that. What we're doing, what we're seeing now is a reversal of that. The Russians are slowly gaining very small bits of territory and paying a huge price for them. And the Ukrainians are losing very small bits of territory and also paying a huge price for them. It is horrific to watch this. And that's just one part of this war, which is a land war of attrition, trench warfare reminiscent of World War I in eastern Ukraine. There is a second war going on, which is an aerial war waged by Russia against Ukraine with the help of um, cruise missiles, of ballistic missiles, and of usually Iranian-made drones against critical infrastructure and against civilian habitations all of which obviously in complete contravention of the laws of war and the Geneva Conventions. This is a brutal, cynical, sadistic campaign of terror aimed at eroding the 
really remarkable resilience and resistance of Ukraine's civilian population and its political leadership. And it is equally aimed as a campaign of terror against Western support of Ukraine. It's supposed to paralyze the Ukrainians and paralyze us. And I think what we're seeing here on both levels, both in the land war in eastern Ukraine and in this aerial war of terror, is two things, a willingness to use almost any means towards Putin's ends. And I think a, a rhetoric and methods that do not suggest a leadership that is capable or willing to make compromises or negotiate settlement. I will come to that later. But I will, I will say here that I think the, the only terms on which the Kremlin is willing to negotiate are its terms, not terms arrived at you know, where each party moves. But, and the Kremlin has said this over and over again, Medvedev has, has said it, Lavrov has said it, Putin has said it. Our goal is for Ukraine to stop existing as an independent sovereign nation with its own culture. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be negotiations at some point. I think there have to be. Every war ends with a negotiation. But I think, and here I'm parroting what Western leaders are saying, they have to be on Ukraine's terms at a time of Ukraine's choosing. And I think that what we have to do and what we can do to help Ukraine is to make it clear to the Kremlin that this will only happen once the Kremlin has ceased to believe that it can win the war militarily. And frankly, I have a hard time imagining that the chief negotiator for Russia will then be the war criminal who's currently the chief man in the Kremlin, but that's just me. Um, but I, if I try to imagine what the Russian strategy is here, I believe the Russians think that time and perhaps the weather to some degree, all the winter winter has been much milder than we, than we feared. I think the, the Kremlin thinks that time is on his side. The man in the Kremlin thinks that time is on his side and that we can deplete, exhaust and paralyze both Ukraine and its Western supporters. And that leads me to the strategic choices for the West. I think there are two, and neither of them is without risk. I personally believe one to be better than the other, but they are what is currently being discussed in Western capitals. We can, in the name of prudence, and in the name of preventing escalation, go on giving Ukraine just enough support to keep Russia at bay and doesn't lose itself. Or, on the other hand, we can give it what it needs to regain um, all of its territory. And by all, I mean mainland Ukraine. I personally would perhaps make, I'm willing to contemplate an accommodation for Crimea for very pragmatic practical reasons because it is so heavily fortified and because it is so meaningful um, for, for Russia and Russian history. So I can imagine for Crimea a solution perhaps on the level of the Berlin Statute where we said we consider the occupation of Berlin to be illegal, but we are willing to contemplate a, a sort of, you know, some sort of statute with international oversight. I suppose you might want to discuss, and I will leave this for discussion, whether giving Ukraine the weapons it needs to regain its territory would not force a, a cornered Putin to escalate and make good on his threats to, to use nuclear weapons. I personally don't believe that. I think that that theory has been tested, and I think it is less likely than it was perhaps a couple of months ago. But it's not impossible. No responsible statement, statesman can exclude that. And I'm grateful that Western statesmen are being responsible and are being very cautious. And I think also that the White House, at the very least, had made it, has made it very clear to the Kremlin that there would be extremely harsh, albeit conventional, consequences if Putin decided to use substrategic nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Um, the point I want to make here is that a war of attrition in Ukraine that drags on for years or a stalemate or a forced negotiation um, would very probably allow Putin to regroup and attack again. I have absolutely no confidence, zero confidence, in a scenario where Putin accepts uh, a 
negotiate a territorial settlement and then doesn't try again in a couple of years. I think it would almost guarantee Ukraine becoming a failed state. And I think that would be the victory of might over right, and it would be t a terrible blow for the international legal order. And I think for a country like Portugal, a smaller country in Europe, which like all smaller countries everywhere in the world, has a special stake and a vested interest in an international order that does not allow the victory of might over right, I think that would be a very serious thing. And not just because, as I've now learned for the first time, you have a very large Ukrainian community that is very well integrated. Um, and and that well before you, you received, generously received Ukrainian refugees. So my proposition is that Ukrainians should be given what they need to defend themselves, and that we should at the same time continue increasing sanctions on Russia. My second point is that um, there is a huge discussion in the West, certainly in Germany, especially in Germany, um, None of us want to be parties to this conflict, right? The fattest red line that Western governments have drawn in conversations with the Kremlin is that we, NATO, will not intervene. We are not parties to this conflict. We will not send NATO troops, right? We are supporting a country in defending itself. This is self-defense as it is regulated in the United Nations Charter. The problem is that Putin sees us as parties. And I don't think we can change that. We have really been exquisitely careful in our messaging around this point. We are helping Ukraine, but we are not engaging as combatants. But the truth is that Putin has been waging measures short of war against all of us for the past decade. He has been conducting influence and ensnaring us into dependencies. He's deployed propaganda, disinformation, as well as material support for hard right parties across Europe. And I can say a great deal about this for the German space at any rate, and perhaps some of you have, have opinions on, on, on Portugal in this context. And certainly for Germany, it is true that he has weaponized our reliance on Russian fossil fuel imports. But, and here I would like to quote my, my Brookings colleague Fiona, West, uh, Fiona Hill. He sees, he sees this war with Ukraine also as a full-on war with the West. That was, um, has been made clear uh, multiple times by the Kremlin in its rhetoric by Lavrov, by Medvedev, by others. And I think that what is at stake here is not just the future of Ukraine, but the future of the European security order, and not just the post-1989 security order, with its enlargement of NATO and of the EU towards the east, but the European security order after 1945. What this really is, I believe, is about neutralizing Europe, not just Eastern Europe, but Western Europe, and getting the Americans out of Europe. That is what is the, the purpose here. And I think that ultimately Putin sees all of Europe as a Russian potential sphere of influence. And what that means is that we, at the same time as we help Ukraine, have to very urgently see to our own deterrence and defense and resilience. And some of you have been, I'm sure, following the news stories about how NATO and, in fact, even the Americans have de been depleting their stockpiles of not just heavy weapons but ammunition, which for a very long time have been produced only on demand by Western defense industries, including the American defense industries. And that, in fact, as we continue to give material to Ukraine, we are depriving ourselves of the, of the real time in this moment ability to provide credible deterrence and effective defense for NATO territory. That is something I never thought I would, was, was going to have to say. But that is where we are. And I think that that is something that is probably the most urgent item on defense ministers' agendas right now, because it entails governments telling the defense industry <laughs> and probably giving them guarantees that they have to increase production now and will probably have to increase production for the foreseeable future. That's a, you know, that's a, a huge undertaking that, you know, in a zero, zero sum, some world of national budgets can have political, you know, consequent risks, right? You can easily see how that kind of situation might be depicted as a zero-sum game uh, by, by political opponents of these developments, certainly by the hard right. 
The third point I want to make is that we are nowhere near the end of this conflict. I think that's already become very clear. We're not seeing a, a, a proximate resolution of this by military means, or in fact, if what I've said is correct, by political means. And we're seeing Putin still, and with some success, casting his invasion of Ukraine as a war of the West on the global South, a term I dislike and hate to use, but I'm gonna use it as a shortcut, um, as a war on the rest of the world, as it were, the non-Western world, where we are, because we are helping Ukraine, we are uh, preventing them from access to uh, grains and, and minerals um, and other and fertilizers produced by Ukraine, which is an astonishingly rever cynical reversal of the facts. We're also seeing, in a slightly less studied development, a lot of very odd attacks, uh, or shall we say, events related to critical infrastructure in Europe. Right? We're seeing cable lines suddenly going out of business, never mind, of course, um, a certain pipeline. Um, in a couple months ago in Germany, all of uh, northern Germany's train traffic was stopped because um, fiber optic cables uh, that provided the communication, communication for the train service uh, were, were cut with a great deal of technical expertise as to exactly where to cut and how. Um, we've, seen, we've seen underwater cables um, cut near the Shetland Islands, and it's still not clear there whether that was an accident or not, but um, at least the, f the, the, the fact that there are conflicting reports suggests that something is going on. Um, and apparently Lufthansa had to cancel a lot of flights today, again, because of cyber issues. So what I'm trying to say is that we are looking at a future where I think there is no quick resolution to this war, and where we are looking at a conflict that can be waged not just in kinetic terms in Ukraine, but on other vectors, as the, as the, the war studies people say, and in other domains, both the physical and the, and, the, and the digital, within the West and around the globe, using everything from disinformation to, to sabotage attacks on critical infrastructure. And so, I, potentially, this is not just a global war in Putin's mind. It can also become a global war, in fact, and is something that we are going to have to, I think, prepare ourselves for. And that requires a great deal of resilience um, of democracies because democracy is based on, on popular consent, and popular consent, of course, needs to be earned. And that brings me to my fourth point, which, of course, is that we can see a lot of tests already for allied cohesion. A lot of people have remarked just how extraordinary the, the cohesion has been that we have seen in, in this war, right? We've seen an unexpected reinvigoration of NATO, which had been pronounced brain dead by certain French presidents. Um, we've seen if you, a, a remarkable, uh, remarkably forceful role of the European Union, including the Commission president, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, we've seen a really quite important role played by a certain Portuguese politician at the head of the United Nations, right? Mr. Guterres. And even the International Criminal Court um, being resuscitated from near certain death. Um, you're seeing Fiden, uh, sorry, Finland and Sweden wanting to join NATO, something that I thought I was not going to see in my lifetime. And Ukraine and Moldova being promised EU membership, something that seemed absolutely improbable a year ago. You're seeing Japan and South Korea supporting Western sanctions, and you're seeing UN General Assembly resolutions, where a remarkable number of non-Western countries are either voting in favor of Western propositions or abstaining. In other words, not voting with Russia or with China. But the problem, of course, is that unity is um, at risk of eroding over time, and it faces tremendous counterforces. And those counterforces, the most significant of that counterforce, of course, is China. You remember that during the Beijing Olympics on February 8th of last year, so three weeks before the invasion, the Russians and the Chinese signed a, a declaration of limitless friendship. <laughs> and there is, there is, I think, no question studied so carefully by, by Western analysts and Western intelligence services as just exactly what China is doing and to what degree 
um, in relation to this war. And so we're not seeing right now the Chinese giving Russia weapons, but it's also not condemning the Kremlin. And in fact, it is quite actively supporting Kremlin narratives and talking points in international fora, especially in non-Western audiences. And at the same time, we're seeing key, key middle powers and swing states like India and South Africa, the Gulf states, Mexico, hedging on both sides or playing both sides in ways that um, tend to undermine Western unity. And when those swing states include a major NATO member like Turkey, um, you can see how that begins to import problems into the alliance. Now, I think that Erdogan's situation has become somewhat more complicated by this horrific earthquake of, of last week in ways that I think we, don't, we can't quite see how that will play out yet. It might both constrain him and, and perhaps make him more, more determined on this course. It's not quite clear. I have a fantastic colleague um, from Turkey, Asla Aydin Bastaş, who, who can see that this could go both ways. So I'm going to, I'm going to be non-committal on this. But of course, you know, the, the thing that we're also seeing is, is tensions in, inside our own countries, right? There was horrific concern in Germany about inflation and spiking gas prices, and I'm sure you've had that here as well. And of course, the Germans threw, as, as they do, um, very large amounts of money at that. Um, there was a 200 billion package um, to offset industry and consumer um, costs created by the decoupling from, from Russian energy. Um, but of course, and, and, and we, we sort of went around world markets and hoovered up at liquid national gas like crazy. But the result, of course, was that the Germans thereby angered their neighbors because they were pr driving up the prices for everybody and making the LNG even more scarce, right? Um, you can see how, how that can turn into a sustained change. And I think the only thing right now that is saving us from a real international um, fight over this is the mild weather. Right. I think if we'd had a hard winter, this would all look much uglier. Another issue of, of concern is, is President Biden's uh, new cli climate legislation and his, and his CHIPS Ex Export Control Act. The, the, so the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really climate subsidy legislation, and which had uh, numerous European leaders um, scuttled to Washington very quickly uh, to say what you're doing is basically wooing our industries away to America. And if you do that, then uh, we will have serious problems within this alliance. And of course, the CHIPS Act is forcing, um, and, I, and I think the Dutch have finally agreed to this, who are big chips producers themselves with the ASML company, uh, the, the major chips producers outside of Taiwan, Japan, Japan and the Dutch have now signed onto the American line. But I don't, I don't foresee that that will be the end of the tensions around technology, high-tech export controls. And we can all imagine, can't we, another summer of record heat, of droughts, uh, forest fires that drive home the very real risk to us as individuals in our generation of pushing out climate mitigation strategies. In other words, we can all see, right, these discussions turning into a zero-sum game between security and climate mitigation and social justice, right? And this is what brings me to your topic of democracy. Democracies depend on the consent of the governed. And when they don't, when they ignore the consent of the government, then you have developments like the rise of populist parties in my country. You have the nationwide strikes in France. And you have the rise of the Magarite in America. Well, that would be a, a topic for another evening to discuss, and maybe we can do that in Q&A. But, but that is clearly there will be no allied cohesion without careful attention being paid to the impact of allied policies towards about on security and, and for, for Ukraine um, and their impact at home. This is where I think I need to mention the midterms in America, which you know, people like me, and including me, sadly, I was quite wrong in my predictions, 
thought would um, produce a GOP tsunami and a MAGA right tsunami, and they ended up not doing that. And again, that is a phenomenon on the level of the mild, the surprisingly mild winter, right? So we got a surprisingly mild, mild winter election, which has brought the Biden administration and and its Western, its European allies, two years time. We don't quite know yet how the GOP majority in the House and the very hard MAGA group there that's trying to make the speaker's life hell will play out in, in concrete politics. And I think some of the GOP senators that are going to Munich this weekend are going there to say this is a matter of bipartisan consensus and ignore, ignore the crazies at home. Um, I think the question remains open what the crazies at home tend to do about that, intend to do about that. So, I think it's an open question, but, the, but my, the point I want to make here is that we ignore the democratic aspects of this conflict at our peril. These things are welded together, and no, no politician will survive this period if he does not manage to convince his electorate or her electorate of what he's doing or she is doing. My fifth point, and I'm nearing my, the end of my time, so I'll try to scramble a little bit. My fifth point is, is that while we have been given a respite uh, by an active alliance, very active energy substitution policies, remarkably so, a mild winter and an, uh, an American midterm election that has gone better than feared, the European security order is still more at risk than at any time since 1945. And the German director of domestic intelligence, Thomas Haldenbang, said at a public hearing a couple months ago, Russia is the storm, but China is climate change, which I thought was a useful way of putting it because one is an immediate and urgent challenge and the other one is a pacing challenge. But, you know, I, I think that I can, I, I think there is a starker way of putting that. And, and it is, I think we can say that if we do not use this period to look at how we run our democracies and how we organize our security and defense and how we organize the security of, of our periphery against the depredations, against the predatory behavior of autocratic great powers. We are at risk of entering, a, in Europe, a strategic ice age where we lose on all fronts. And it's true that we have actually, for the first time, and more so than, for example, in the Iraq war or in, in the Yugoslav wars or in Afghanistan, seen the, the Europeans and the European Union play a really powerful role because of our economic and regulatory power and the, the weight that we have added to sanctions against Russia. Right? I think that we would be, and America would be in a very, very different place without the weight of European support. But we've also been given a real lessons in the, in the shortcomings of our power, right? And those shortcomings are the ones I've already detailed and the shortcomings of our ability to deter and defend ourselves. And I am, you know, I'm really not, um, I occasionally get called a warmonger in, in, um, in, in, on Twitter in Germany, and I'm really not. I'm a, I'm a trained human rights lawyer, and I'm a constitutional lawyer, and I would like a world without war. But I've also been in war zone, and I've, I've covered them, and, I've, and, I, and I know evil when I see it. And I don't want this to happen again. And I want, I want the war in Ukraine to end, because I find it almost unbearable to watch. And I find the thought that we should not be able to do anything to stop it unbearable, and I think it would un undermine our peace of mind as Europeans and our self-respect forever if we couldn't. So I think we need, to, we need to now, and we've just been given these two more years until the American election in 2024, we need to now discuss among ourselves and with each other what we need to do in case Russia wins, in case Ukraine loses, in case China decides to use the moment and take sides with Russia, or in case China decides to use the moment and do something against Taiwan, all of which would have, I think, incalculable consequences for us. And certainly, if Ukraine is defeated, that would create a huge failed state, a shameful humanitarian disaster, and a source of persistent insecurity on our doorstep. And 
Frankly, I think that if Russia doesn't abandon its imperial ambitions, if Russia doesn't learn how to govern itself differently, it is on a downward trajectory for the foreseeable future, and it could become a failing great power and an enduring security challenge on our, on, on our borders in ways that I think could under, undercut the entire European security order. And of course the Chinese are watching us carefully, right? The Chinese are, are looking very closely as to what we're doing, where our strengths and our weaknesses are. And of course they have a strategy of global preeminence that has been playing out in their visible diplomacy in Europe, right? In the behavior of their ambassadors, in their buying up of, of ports, in their attempts to capture the European 5G network, and so on and so on. And of course, it works persistently to split Europe off from the US. All you have to do is to go to the videos of the last Munich Security Conference and look at the seasoned diplomat Wang Yi and his, and his speech there, the way he says to the Europeans, you know, this is really none of your business and you should stay out of Ukraine, it's none of your concern. That tells you everything you need to know and that was just the weekend before the invasion. So I think that we really need to close ranks. We need to look urgently to our own defense. Um, we should bear a greater share of the transatlantic burden for our own security, and that includes that of, of Ukraine. And I think we need to think about how we reduce and mitigate our dependence on China. You notice I'm not, I'm not saying uncoupling from China, which I don't think anybody seriously want, and certainly nobody could do. But reduce and mitigate, de-risk, as the as the econ economic specialists say, absolutely. And let me make a, a final point, um, in which I was alluding to before, but I think is worth confronting um, head on, which is that this war has characteristics that differentiate it from other wars that we have seen. And it's the fact that Vladimir Putin himself, his fellow leaders, um, Russian politicians and Russian state-controlled media speak about Ukraine and speak about the West in terms that seem increasingly, frankly, very often seem unhinged because they are so violent and they are so extreme but I think that we need to take seriously and literally. And I've, as I said, I've covered wars in Central Africa and in the Balkans, and it unfortunately reminds me of the language of the genocidaire in, in Rwanda, of some of the language used by Slobodan Milosevic and others. Yeah. And for a German of my generation, it is, brings up very, very specific associations. There is a famous Jewish-German converted, but that was of no interest to the Nazis who considered him a Jew anyway, Victor Klemperer, who lived in Dresden as a professor of Romance languages and managed to survive the war because his wife was a Gentile and he managed to sort of elude the grasp of the Gestapo, although they tried to capture him several times. And uh, two decades ago, I believe this, his, his um, diaries were published, which I recommend to everybody because they are one of the most poignant and forceful um, memoirs of what it was like as a, as a German Jew to, to suffer under the Nazi regime and the Holocaust. But he also wrote something that every German my, of my generation had to read in school, which was the Lingua Tati Imperi, a, st a short study of the language of the Third Reich. And it was a sort of German answer uh, to Orwell's study of the language of, of, of uh, dictatorship in 1984, and I recommend it to anybody. And it is, in the modern term, I suppose, for this is othering. Um, the somewhat older term for what the Russians are doing is, um, is something that you can find in, in Karl Schmidt. Karl Schmidt ref has developed in his writing, he was the crown jurist of the Third Reich, he had, in his writing, he developed the concept of the relative and the absolute enemy. The relative enemy is one that, with whom you can negotiate. The absolute enemy is one who is so different from you that his differentness is an existential threat to you, and therefore it must be eliminated. And I have to say that the rhetoric 
of the Russian leadership about Ukraine reminds me of nothing so much as this concept of the enemy absolute incarcerate. And so I think that we as democracies may have to contemplate the awful possibility of having adversaries who are not just competitors, who are not just rivals, but adversaries who consider us as something else. Now, I'm not suggesting we should adopt the same attitude. Of course not. I think that would destroy us culturally and as democracies. Uh, you should never do that. Um, there's this famous saying by, from Friedrich Nietzsche, if you stare into the abyss, it stares back at you. It's dangerous to contemplate these things, psychologically and intellectually and morally. But I think what we may be failing to see, at least what I think some of them at the German debate about this may be failing to see, and I would be very curious to hear from you what the Portuguese debate is here, but some of the German debate, I think, is refusing to see the absolutist nature of the enmity in Russian discourse towards Ukraine and towards the West. And I think if you look more closely at this language, you will also find that a lot of it can be found in the language of the ethno-nationalist hard right. right? There is a lot of overlap there. <coughs> and I think what ultimately this is about is a fear, the fear of the hard right of liberal modernity, the fear of complexity, the fear of difference, right? And it is, I suppose, psychologically in many ways a reaction to a fear of failure, a fear of systems overload, a fear of not being able to cope with the complexities and the interdependencies of modern life. And we've ha had that kind of experience, violence that comes out of an explosion, a explosion of, of fear many times in human history. And of course, the Germans have been a part of that in the 20th century in the biggest possible way. And so I just want to say, as we think about how, to what degree we're willing to pressure the Ukrainians into negotiating, I think we also have to think about what it is that we think the Russians are doing here, right? And what they want from Ukraine or what they want to do to Ukraine. All right, I'm going to, I'm far over my time and I'm going to not talk about Germany. Um, I'm just going to say, uh, I, think, I think frankly, my government is trying really hard but it's not trying hard enough. And I think it can need all the help it can, it can get from friendly allies and neighbors, even when they're a little farther away, like Portugal. And I think, very simply, that we're not going to come out of this truly historic crisis if we do not find a way of working together as European nations, of overcoming our differences, and of finding a common purpose in preserving a European security order in, in which everyone can live at peace. That's a tall order, but I think the alternative is one that none of us can wish. So I'm going to stop here and talk to Bruno. Thank you uh, very much, Rita, for this uh, series and also for inviting me to, to moderate this session. Thank you, Constance, for this excellent <laughs> initial talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep the conversation also brief so that we have some time. We started also a bit later, so I think we can, we can get some extra time. But um, So I would start by saying that uh, I'm also accused of sometimes of being a hawk or a warmonger. <laughs> And I actually don't have your much nicer background. I'm actu I actually have a PhD in war studies, so you so know, it kind of tends to stick. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I fully agree that uh, the best we can aspire to is some kind of armed peace, uh, both in terms of Ukraine and, and Europe. And I think that uh, nothing is more guaranteed to prolong the war, encourage uh, further uh, Russian aggression, than even to signal a weakening of support uh, exactly. to, yeah. towards Ukraine. Um, and I also think that uh, your final point is a very powerful one. I think that it's, it's really undeniable that we see uh, officially sponsored propaganda in, in state TV and even statements from, from senior officials, from the most senior officials, which is really geno genocidal uh, yeah. from, from Russia. Um, so probably this is 
uh, one of those very good examples of uh, in it, which often happen in international politics, where you are asked what is the the kind of the guaranteed successful good option, and you really have to say there is isn't none. Uh, maybe we, yeah. we can we can shoot, pick your poison is basically the, the yeah. option. Um, but uh, in terms of, of uh, moving forward to the questions and, and your your comments. Uh, and linking also with the wider topic here. Um, so the, the series is called uh, Democracy the Way Ahead, but as, as you know, for instance, Freedom House has published these mm. terrible reports. I think the last one was Democracy and the Siege, the, or the, the one before was the regression of democracy. Mm. Uh, they estimate like 20% like only of, of global population nowadays live in, lives in democracies. Um, so in a very pragmatic way, is, is it really smart to frame this uh, struggle, this support for Ukraine in terms of a fight for democracy? Is this the best way to win France for mm. Ukraine or we need some, uh, maybe that, but also some other arguments if we think no, for instance, yeah, of the global I, I think South. that's a really good question and, and it's something on which I have a view. I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm sure many of you who study American politics are aware that the Biden administration came in sort of waving the flag of, you know, democracies versus autocracies, which I have to say, again, I have tremendous sympathy for, but I think is unhelpful with a capital U, as British diplomats would say, uh, in the current context because of the, um, let me put this in sort of strategy geek terms. We're, we're in a period where, we're having, where we have a juxtaposition of two wars, you know? a very archaic, brutal, kinetic war you know? that looks like all the classic sort of European wars, people killing each other in huge quantities in the most brutal possible way. And then you have the West trying to, while it's supporting Ukraine militarily, in a very much more sophisticated way, trying to counter-weaponize economic interdependence against Russia, right? Russia was trying to weaponize our dependence on its fossil fuels, and we are trying to counter-dependence the fact that it is very much integrated with the global economy with the help of sanctions and export controls, which any of you who have ever worked in this field know that sanctions require sort of in extremely detailed legal preparations, and if you will recall that after the first set of sanctions did not appear to produce a result, apart from derisive you know, sneering from the Kremlin, um, the West, I think within the first week of the Russian invasion, invasion, froze the Russian central bank's assets over the weekend. That was the equivalent of a, you know, a financial nuclear bomb in many ways, at least in, the, in psychological terms. It, for a variety of reasons, the Russian economy has pr proved to be quite resilient, not least because it continues to receive, receive fossil fuels income from elsewhere, right? Um, and because it, man it, it, you know, it has managed to save as well. But the, that has been a sort of remarkably precisely calibrated Western response. And it requires the, you know, it required a degree of political collaboration that wasn't obviously going to happen after the twin disasters of AUKUS and, and the Afghanistan withdrawal, right? The fact that that was, and it probably started to happen, you know, in August, oh, sorry, in, in October, November of 2021. So three, four months before the actual invasion, the Americans were clearly already talking to the Europeans and to the Swiss um, and saying, if X happens, we must be able to do Y, in which case we would need to do the following things now, which is really quite something. Um, <coughs> am I answering your question? Well, uh, and, uh, but I'll, I'll follow up with, with another one. So in terms of... The global south, I think actually... Oh, your, yes, I'm sorry. Point you said that. Yes, I'm sorry. Now no. I understand what you, where you were getting at. I'm sorry, I lost track. It's been a very long day, as Rita knows. Um, so in this kind of context of sort of counter-weaponization of economic interdependence, middle powers suddenly gain enormous power, right? Military power is less important, and middle powers, who, as it were, you know, have options, can hedge, suddenly have much more power 
than, than they have ever had. Right? So the Mexicans and the South Africans and the Indians are having a field day, you know, looking at all of us, sort of looking first at the Chinese, then at us, then the, at the Americans, then back at the Chinese, and saying, so what do you have to offer? Um, and to some degree, um, one sympathizes with them, right? Because, um, you know, our behavior hasn't always been very sort of principled, nor, has it, nor have we avoided double standards. I'm being ironic here, I hope you realize that. Um, and and I, can, I can see how somebody sitting in New Delhi or in Mexico City might think, I'm going to exploit this, right? Um, but I think, again, the, and I think one of the, the more significant and weighty questions that, that Western diplomats now have to deal with is how to, shall we say, prevent a bandwagoning of these states with China and or Russia, um, while at the same time not sort of pulling the colonial card, as it were, or sort of bringing an undue amount of, uh, an inappropriate amount of bullying to bear. Yeah, in other words, how do we convince people that we're the better partner? Right? And, and there I think um, it has two elements, really. I think a sort of appropriate degree of, of humility about our past behavior, you know, combined with um, the perhaps a, a, a carefully crafted conversation about the things that we have, been, we, we have seen China doing, say, in Africa or elsewhere, in other words, building enormous projects but bringing in its own labors and giving crippling loans to, to um, non-Western governments, right? And, and then saying, you know, um, we realize that you need these projects and you need these loans, but we're also seeing the conditions that you are getting and we think we can do better, right? But that's a completely different style and tone of diplomacy than, you know what, we're the democracies, we're in the right, fall in line. So I, I have to say, you know, I think that this might actually be a moment where we can sort of learn, you know, unlearn some bad habits and relearn some good ones. Yeah, it's certainly true that you cannot simply ask countries to cut ties with China and then offer no kind of interesting alternative in terms exactly. of the investment. Yeah. And uh, I think another point which you made actually about Portugal, but I think is also useful in terms of the global south, is this basic point about uh, weaker states having mm -hmm. a, a very strong interest in not normalizing this kind of return of a war yeah, of conquest. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a powerful point. Um, in terms of, of Germany, uh, I did now read your article at the FT, so the, uh, how, how, how much of a real change is this Zeitenwende? You mentioned Schrodinger's cat. And, but in, specifically in terms of, and maybe some people here have not read it, but Specifically in terms of, of Russia, how much, mm -hmm. how much of a change is there? I, I think there maybe is, yeah, there's a sure. real change. Absolutely. But then also in terms of yeah. China and also the use of military force, which I think maybe are... So we are have time test. until tomorrow <laughs> afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me, let me try and give a slightly more disciplined and therefore shorter answer. Um, now that I'm sitting and have had some water, um, that's a little easier. Uh, so, you know, I'll start with what you, I'll start with Twitter. Um, you know, if, I, if you make the mistake like me of spending too much time on Twitter, uh, you can get the impression that a lot of people think that Germany is a deeply corrupt country. Um, actually, for that, it's enough to read the comments section under my columns in the FT. Um, it's a deeply corrupt country that either should be much better friends with, with the Russians because they're the only ones who are good for us, or we're a deeply corrupt country that has sold its heart and, and, and the rest of Europe to, to Russia. Um, neither of those, of course, are true. Um, I'm the most overrated trope of the conversation about Germany is the, you know what, history weighs so heavily on us we can't move. We can't change. That's just not true. Uh, I have been covering German defense and security policy since, uh, and this, I'm afraid this dates me, since the early 90s as a rookie, as, a, as an intern, uh, when a Berlin Daily paper sent me to Somalia because we sent a brigade there that then pr proceeded to sit in the middle of the desert because the Indian brigade that it was supposed to protect never arrived from India. Um, that was our first adventure. Um, post post fall of the wall and and so I would say that we have actually done a great deal. We have we fought in combat in the Balkans. The the division that went into Kosovo after the air bombardment of of Kos of of Serbia 
you know, for 77 days. That division was headed by a German general. And it shot for the first time in anger you know, since 1945. And that was the Balkans. We have lost soldiers in combat in Afghanistan. Right? To pretend that we are a vegetarian, herbivorous country you know, is just not true. Right? Um, and of course, you know, we, are, we, we like to say that we're you know, the, 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 the country that profits most from Europe and that there we, you know, whatever we do is good for Europe. You know, as you know, our, in our economic policies, we can be quite ruthless. Um, and so that's also, we're not herbivorous in that context either. But the truth is that I think there is now a real reckoning going on in German, in German political elites about the mistakes of the past. Um, and part of that reckoning, of course, is around the figure of Angela Merkel and her, her four-term tenure of a total of 16 years, three of which in coalition with the Social Democrats, one with the Liberals, um, in which she steadfastly refused to, to end the Nord Stream 2 project, despite the warnings and the criticism from Eastern European partners and from the Americans, for that matter. And it seems to me that, in retrospect, they were right, right? And she was wrong. And although she is writing an autobiography and although she is sort of has been attempting a slow re-entry into, into public debate, that part, of, that, that part of the discussion hasn't been going so well for her. And the most interesting conversation is happening in the Social Democrats, who of course had this ideological commitment to Ostpolitik. And, and here I sort of declare my, my colors. My, my father, my, my parents voted SPD in the in the 1970s because the CDU, the Conservative, wanted to have parts of Poland back. And my parents said, that's not decent. Of course we're voting for Willy Brandt, right? Um, but, but Ostpolitik was a, you know, a concept with meaning at the time. But even at the time, it paid significantly less notice and respect to um, what Germany had done in the killing fields, as Timothy Snyder calls it, of Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus than to what we had done to the Soviets, right? And so what the Social Democrats are discussing now, and I think with great seriousness and great energy, is, is that this is no longer a posture that they can decently adopt. And for those of you who are really interested in this, there is a Social Democratic paper published about 10 days ago that, um, de that puts this on the line, and I think there is an English version on, on the website of the SPD as well. And I think that there is no going back behind that. That's a real cultural change, and it was well overdue, but it's serious and it's, and it's, and it's sincere. Um, of course, you are based in the US, so how do you think the US uh, is seeing the, the role of Europe in this? Is, yeah. is, is Europe yeah. kind of getting positive Marks, positive <laughs> rates, or, or...? You know, I wouldn't put it in quite that way because I don't think this American government thinks of itself as a teacher and us as students, mm -hmm. right? Uh, nor, thankfully, does it see of us see us as sort of, uh, you know, un unruly, you know, fools who have re refused to, play, to pay the fees for the mafia boss who protects them, right? <laughs> uh, which you got in the previous lot, um, which is also very unpleasant, and particularly unpleasant for the Germans. Uh, who I think got some a lot of the a lot of the opprobrium. Um, I think this administration has a very sophisticated understanding of the way the world works, and by by that I mean by the way in which military power and economic power and global interdependence work to both maximize and limit it, each other. Yeah? And and that the way in which this administration has both sort of made a very serious push to get all of us to help arm Ukraine, but at the same time has acknowledged and respected the, the role and the, and the power of the European Union and of, the, of, the, of Europe on, as a whole in terms of its economic abilities, uh, its abilities to, together with the US, impose sanctions and impose export controls. On, on Russia is really significant. And I have never seen any administration do that in quite this way. And I can tell you from my conversation with European officials that there is profound um, gratitude for this, uh, recognition, but also a sense that frankly, you know, we sort of need to live up to this. You know, it's what we've always asked for, but you know what, we have, a, we have our side to uphold. 
And, and as I was saying earlier, you know, we're looking at a sort of future of... I, I mean, I find the, the climate change metaphor that I used earlier helpful because I think that it, the way we ought to think of, of global... of, of geostrategy is, or of global interdependence, is increasingly of sort of the world as an ecosystem, right? Where, where things are related to each other and small acts can have massive consequences, right? But you can no longer, even as a great power or a superpower, assume that you have full control of the consequences of your actions or that your superior or unparalleled military power will get you outcomes in a world where somebody can weaponize economic interdependence against you, mm. right? And that is something that this administration has understood yeah, in, in to a degree of sophistication that I find really remarkable, but that has real consequences for us because, of course, I mean, Europe is one of the most vulnerable ecosystems on the planet, right? We have very high um, standards of our democracies. We have very high living standards. We have very high expectations of prosperity, safety, and happiness, right? And we have comparatively low um, willingness to do anything for that because um, we've outsourced our security for such a long time to the Americans and because we Germans outsourced, you know, I mean, we, we were very happy to rely on cheap Russian gas because it gave us a competitive advantage in the world and, and of course, in Europe. And we were, of course, very happy. I mean, all of our massive growth in the past decade was fueled by Chinese demand. And, a Chinese, and we, we were not, I think there was a great deal of denial in German di public discourse going on both about what the Russians were doing to make us even more dependent. I mean, just give me, let me give you an example that, yeah, that not everybody may know here. Um, one of the things that we found out as, we, as, the, as the new government, the Schultz government, took over in December 8th, and it became clear that the Russians were, were you know, massing troops, uh, and there was this very, very harsh discussions around Nord Stream 2. So people started, the new government and the green economics minister started asking questions about the security of our gas supply in case the Russians decided to turn it off. And that very naturally led to the question of the status of our gas storage capabilities. Now, the agency in Germany that is responsible for monitoring that is the Bundesnetzagentur, the Federal Network Agency, an agency that had led a peaceful, quiet, and unobserved life <laughs> in the backwaters of German policy, and that suddenly decided to acquire a Twitter account uh, because it found that people were checking its, daily, its, its status reports every day. And, and people like me, and people, members of the press, and politicians. And it suddenly became apparent um, that, the, that A, Germany has the largest gas storage capabilities in all of Europe. What that means, and, and let me tell you, I've since found out that all of these gas, if, if the entirety of that gas storage would um, meet Germany's gas demands for about two and a half months, right? Now, the thing that was suddenly noticed was that unusually these gas storage facilities had not been filled for the winter, but in fact were quite empty. Then more questions were asked, and it turned out that some of the biggest gas storage facilities had in fact been sold by a previous economic minister to Gazprom. Gazprom yeah. um, now, um, that you know, is already a scenario where, where you, as a politician, start going like this, right? And start asking questions. And then, of course, you have to realize that, that some of our eastern neighbors in particular, who were n not like us, somewhere between 55 and 70% dependent on Russian fuel imports, but 100% dependent on fuel imports, if the Russians t decided to turn off the gas to them, and by the way, the Federal Network Agency has a lovely map of the gas pipelines everywhere and where they go, uh, so you can see exactly what the Russians would need to do and what would happen if they cut, you know, if they turned off the tap. Um, we would be, have been asked, as the possessors of the largest gas storage capabilities, to organize reverse flow of gas to our eastern neighbors if, those, if the gas had been stopped there but not to Germany, right? When you can see, you, you, all you had to do was look at the damn map and say, 
This is a fantastic chess field for the Russians to start playing with the taps, right? And how is it possible that nobody has paid attention to the security information implications of these possibilities, right? And so the economics ministry has been working its ass off, and to put it in the vernacular, um, to change these things. Um, and, and to their not inconsiderable credit, um, we have fully decoupled from Russian fossil fuel imports. The plan was decouple from Russian coal by August of last year, decouple from Russian oil by December, and decouple from, ra from Russian gas, I believe, by the end of 2024. Now, it was the Russians who turned off the taps, so we are also now decoupled from Russian gas. Um, but, but, you know, it, again, this is why this, this explanation tells you, uh, or explains in some more detail, why we were so lucky with a mild winter. Right? And why it's so important uh, not to think of these things just in economic terms. So you, uh, also increasingly, it's clear right. that you have to have this kind of strategic vision about uh, excessive dependency in those exactly. Areas. And uh, but not just that. What we also need is a European energy policy mm -hmm. that allows us to help each other in emergencies. Right. Yes. And right now, what we have is a balkanized system of energy provision. With the uh, with you know you know the story of the of the pipeline that the that w was supposed to be built through France yeah. to allow the, the Spanish to transport hydropower and the French didn't want that because the French wanted to be able to export their nuclear power, but not Spanish hydropower going over over French territory. And I mean that frankly, I think that those kinds of divisions to which we of course have contributed are disgraceful. And, and really need to be remedied. And there needs to be, I think, a European system of management for that. Um, because we were lucky once, but we may not be lucky twice. Well, I was going to ask about how do you get democratic support, public support for investment in defense, but maybe I'll turn to the public sure. and maybe they will provide the answer. Uh, so I'll try to be ecumenical and go up and down and left and right, uh, in terms of the geography, not politics. So maybe we can start here. Hi. Um, my question pertains to something that you said way earlier in your speech um, about your first point in which the West should increase their supplying to Ukraine and not be hindered by um, Putin's nuclear threats. And so my question is, do you find that it's not wise to underestimate Putin's decisions and threats, seeing that the last time that many authority figures um, underestimated those threats, it resulted in the invasion of Ukraine. Can we take another sure, one, absolutely. maybe? And yeah. So maybe sure. here, yeah. and then. Uh, hi, Constance. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And thank you to Flat for, for uh, bringing you here. 20,000 questions I would have to, to pose you. Uh, just one, just one. I know, I know, I know, I know. No, 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 no. I, I would, I, I would never. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You said that you don't believe clearly. I think that no one does. That Putin is the man to be in Moscow when negotiations are to be commenced. What about Kiev? Do you think that Zelensky is the president in Ukraine to do these negotiations? Even yesterday, I was hearing an interview from Henry Kissinger uh, to the Lowy Institute, and he clearly said no. For, you know, for, but the argument, it, it makes some sense. It's not what people uh, expect of him. And that is not yeah. what he perhaps is willing to provide. And that is not the expectation. That is not the political uh, uh, leader and figure he has built. So what okay. do you think? You know, OK, those are two interesting questions. I think I actually think that we have ways of influencing uh, Putin's choices about whether to escalate and how, right? Um, and I, but I think that it would be very wrong to just say, you know what, take what you want. Yeah? Because that's what your question implies in some ways, right? Is that we should, if he threatens something, let him have it, right? Because he could make good in his threat. I don't think we can live with the consequences of that, right? And arguably, the, you know, I think one could say that some of the hundreds of thousands of dead in Ukraine are on us because we didn't clearly say that we would not tolerate an invasion of an innocent, sovereign, independent country, right? So, so to that, the answer is no. But I did say that, that, that taking that position does not come without risks. 
Yeah, but I don't think, what I am saying is that this is in the, in the very traditional, classical you know, sense of Greek tragedy, a tragic choice. We have no good choices. We have no choices without risk. So I think we end up taking the choice that leaves us able to look in the mirror in the morning. Yeah. And yeah. we should at least test the risk. I think we yeah. shouldn't kind of self-deter too yeah. much. Exactly. Uh, yeah. right? So you have no indications, for instance, that there was any exactly. major change in terms of nuclear posture from Russia. And of yeah. course the US has the means to do that. And it's yeah. also rational that Russia would really signal uh, visibly that it was changing its posture. Yeah. And let me also add something onto that. Um, if we are talking, or, or the, the, the fear was around not Russia sending an intercontinental ballistic missile somewhere, but using what is called a substrategic nuclear weapon in the battlefield of Ukraine or on a Ukrainian metropolitan center, okay? And if, even for that, um, the, the Russians would have to organize significant preparations which would become visible both to um, Western satellites, but also probably to human intelligence sources, right? There are a variety of preparations that would have to be put in place, yeah, including movements of trains uh, and movements, openings of depots that have been watched extremely carefully since the beginning of this war. In other words, the, the risk of the West not having an advance warning and not being able to issue an extremely stern counter-warning is very low. And I think what the, the American, uh, you know, the, Jake Sullivan has been quoted as saying the consequences of a use of a substrategic nuclear weapon by, by Russia against Ukraine would be quote-unquote horrific, right? That has been passed as meaning not a nuclear response, but a, a, a conventional response, but that would be extremely significant and very painful to Russia, right? And, and it seems to me that that's the kind of thing that would give the Kremlin pause. Yeah. Yeah. And we have also heard, even from China or India, very clear signals that they, exactly. would, not that they would not like that yes. at all. In fact, so. in fact, interestingly enough, you know, Schultz was criticized very hard, uh, very strongly for, for going to Beijing on December 4th last year without taking Ursula von der Leyen or Macron along. He was criticized for not coordinating with other Western leaders. But he actually managed to extract from Xi Jinping a public yeah. declaration that, that the important. Chinese w thought it was not proper for the Russians to threaten the use of nuclear weapons and that they would be extremely unhappy if they, if they used nuclear weapons. Yeah? That was a genuinely significant outcome, outcome of that trip. So I, I'm, I think that right now that risk is a little bit boxed in. Now the question as to, and honestly... Regime uh, change in Russia and, and yeah, government change in Ukraine. Yeah, and honestly, I, 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 I do not, I mean, I've met Henry Kissinger, uh, and I respect him somewhat, though there are things I do not respect him for. And I, I'm sure I don't need to explain that. But, um, but I will say I do not see on what basis Henry Kissinger gets to say that, that, that Zelensky should not rule a... As, as president, a Ukraine that is at peace. Um, I mean, if anybody has the consent of the government, uh, then it's Mr. Zelensky. Yeah. Um, now, sometimes these things change in peacetime. Yeah. Sometimes successful war leaders can be very unsuccessful in peacetime, um, peacetime presidents. And, and I wouldn't put that you know, beyond the realm of the possible. But for any of us to suggest, you know, that we already know that, and so that, part, you know, Zelensky should even offer as part of a negotiation that he would then no longer be at the table, I would find completely astonishing. Yeah, and, and something that I think would exhibit a level a very of hubris, dangerous precedent. <laughs> of hubris on, on, the, on, the, on the part of Western diploma, diplomacy that I think is completely uncalled for. Yeah? So, and, and, and Putin, yeah, and, and I, I also think it's extremely stupid to suggest that a condition of negotiations ought to be regime change in Russia, which is why you're not hearing anybody doing that, right? That would be reckless in the extreme. You know, that would only make, make Putin hang on even more strongly. But, um, but the truth is, you know, it's really not, 
It's it's hard to imagine, you know, anybody ever talking to Putin again, except you know, you know, at arm's length and only in an emergency situation, right? I mean, these these guys are burned. Lavrov is burned, and he knows it. Yeah, Medvedev is burned. You know, these people have all, you know, have been, you know, parties to, you know, one of the worst international crime sprees uh, that the world has seen in recent years. In recent memory. And so they've I, lost uh, yeah. trust completely. A very famous Portuguese diplomat, yeah. uh, Calvit Magalhães, would like to say, you know, yeah. they keep saying diplomats yeah. are patriots who are sent abroad to life for their country, but that's that's yeah. that's not true. If yeah. you, no. maybe, of course, exactly. you have to be strategic yeah. in what you say or not say, but if you keep lying, yeah. you discredit yourself to a degree completely. that you're not yeah. credible yeah. As, a, as a partner. And Lavrov well. used to be a very respected diplomat because, you know, people knew that he would lie to them. But he was seen as extremely experienced and knowledgeable, and so people would go talk to him. I think that's no longer the case. So we have to go back to the audience. Yep. So maybe right. there and there. Ali, excuse Ali. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stetson Mueller, for an enlightening talk, and thank you, Rita Fadden and Flad, for inviting this uh, very interesting speaker. Could you, you, you said your choice would be that the West give Ukraine the wherewithal to drive Russia, Russian troops uh, out of Ukraine except for, mm -hmm. yeah. Could you talk to us a little bit about what the consequences of that strategy might be, particularly for Europe? Mm. Um, sure. Already, point. you know, we have budgets that are uh, yeah. in deficit. You are suggesting yeah. something, at, at the same time you're saying, but <laughs> you need to build up your stock of, uh, of ammunition and, and, and tanks that you will have sent so there. How do you achieve we, this? We need to send much more money. Uh, are we not threatening our social model? I mean, what are the consequences sure. of Europe if we do what you suggest? Sure, Thank you. absolutely. And then do you want a second? A second one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, already. Okay, good. Um, the question is about um, democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the Economist Intelligence Unit um, survey, they always do, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, democracy was, on a, it was going down in comparison to other totalitarian systems. And there was, a, I think it was about 6% on real democracy, what they described, and the rest was 45% in total on flawed democracies. Mm. As a German, my concern is... Uh, when we look at the global picture and we look at the European picture and we have populism on the rise and we need unity against Russia, how can we do that, that this doesn't flip and that it breaks the unity mm. and that how can we make really democracy attractive so that India and others, they see also an economic interest in that. Okay. Thank you. okay. So... You know, b both of those are, are very complex questions, are very good ones, and there are no easy answers to them. Um, but I'm try going to try and be a little bit shorter so as not to, you know, monopolize the airspace. So I'm, I'm going to be a little bit sort of more graphic in, in the way I respond to them. And to you, sir, I would say we have the choice between one failed state on Europe's doorstep or two. I think that Russia is not going anywhere good, right? Um, and whereas with Ukraine has a choice, or rather we can give Ukraine a choice you know, by defending it. And I think that to have, that to deal with the consequences of, of a Russia that has essentially put itself outside of the confines of civilized nations you know, for probably you know, the rest of our lifetimes will already be a very significant challenge to European security. And it is not one that we solve by giving it Ukraine, right? It is not one that we solve by saying, you know what, you can have it and take Moldova too. You know? And while you're at it, take the Baltics. You know, they're NATO members, but they're really small. Have them. That's, that's not how, th that is, because that is what would happen, right? If we say, you know, Ukraine, we've decided it's not worth a fight. And, I mean, I, I believe profoundly that when we 
protect Ukraine, we are protecting ourselves. We're fighting for ourselves. We're fighting to preserve a European security order. Um, and I'm deeply aware uh, that this can um, imply really painful trade-offs in the short term um, for social budgets or climate mitigation budgets. I'm profoundly aware of that. But I think that we are not going to have climate mitigation budgets or social budgets if we allow Russia to do as it pleases and to institute the rule of the, of the strong on the European continent because I think that's, that's w what we would be facing. And so, you know, th that's a depressing prospect. But then on the other hand, I do, see, I do see rays of light. I do think that the Ukrainians have been extraordinarily resilient, have been extraordinarily inventive, and that um, it's a country with tremendous wealth, both in rare earths, in, uh, in, in minerals, in, in steel, and in agriculture, and a population that is clearly quite well educated you know, and very, very able to defend itself if given, if given the means to do so. Um, and that if we could manage to turn Ukraine around, you know, that that would be of benefit to all of us. Um, in terms of security, but also in terms of trading and economic prosperity. Yeah? There is, I mean, you know, this sounds so utilitarian, but I think that a Ukraine that, that managed to reconstruct and that sort of, you know, took on peace with the same kind of energy that it has taken on defending itself, I think would be a model European in many, many ways, right? And that is not to say I'm not aware of the history of, of sort of corrupt oligarchs and all that, but frankly, I cannot imagine that the oligarchs have had a very good war so far, right? Um, I think that if anything has made the case for the young Ukrainian new reformers that I also know, yeah, it's, it's this war. I, I don't think that the, that the oligarchs come out of this, you know, with their hides unscratched yeah, and, their, and, their, and their fortunes and their networks uh, intact. I doubt that. So, you know, I think there are a lot of really hard choices ahead of us, but I, but I think also that um, the alternatives to making those choices um, would be ultimately very bad. Yeah. Um, on the question of, of democracy, honestly, I mean, I'm, I mean, maybe this is me continuing in an optimist vein, but I, I think that actually autocracies are more fragile than we like to think and that our democracy has proven more resilient than we like to think. I was terribly worried about the AFD when it came, you know, the AFD started out as a professor's party that was upset about the Euro, right? Um, and then we had the migration crisis and suddenly they, they seemed to attract every raving <coughs> ethno-nationalist loony, you know, um, in, 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 in Germany and, and came into the Bundestag at, with 12.6%, um, which made it the leader of the opposition. But, but the thing is that, interestingly enough, the, the AFD has radicalized so visibly you know, that, um, this is a German expression um, that I'm not sure is a literary quote, so Kindlichkeit entstellt. In other words, it, is, it has become recognizable as what it is to the entire public, right? And so while it has, has, it has arguably become you know, more radical, it has at the same time become somewhat less dangerous because People have seen it for what it is and are disgusted by that. The real risk of the AFD right now is, of course, it's tunneling into the security services with great deliberateness and very, um, you know, and with some success. And we've sort of realized that too late. And the domestic intelligence services, police, and the armed forces are now having to sort of pick, you know, pick these extremists out of their services and like, like, you know, like ticks. You know. That's, um, should never have gotten that far, of course. But so I'm. I but but the the the, f the foundation of your question, I think, is how do you in a state where the of mm, where the the nation states control over setting policy and implementing it is constantly challenged by the disruptive forces you know, that that don't stop at borders. You know? Um, how do you how do you 
credibly create the consent of the governed, right? And I think that you have to do that by reinventing the relationship of the state and society and economy. It, this sounds sort of very wonky, but but I think you have to make you have to make governance and democracy credible and livable for the individual at the local level, right? And so you have to pay attention to whether local governance works. And if it doesn't, you have to bloody do something about it, right? And I think you know something about that in Portugal, right? You've, you've had a highly centralized form of government and a highly bureaucratic form of government. And, and perhaps, you know, and I, I've, I was, we were just talking with your, uh, uh, with your colleague from, from the foundation earlier, of the, about the efforts of creating sort of um, pools of you know, accessible data and information you know, about how governments work for, 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 for individual citizens to understand what role they can play in local governments. And I think that is genuinely you know, where the challenge of democracy is at. You know, and there is a lot of work being done on that in my country and elsewhere, and a lot of best practices to share. And if anybody is specific, be interested in the specifics of that, I can recommend people to talk to. Yeah. Okay. So I'm getting a very strong encouragement in terms of to giving the voice, <laughs> giving voice to younger, to younger. Oh, quest. I see. Okay. But, but actually, I don't see anyone. So, uh, so maybe oh, there's lots not of young so young. Ones. So yes. maybe we have there's a young voice them. there. And yeah. then. there you go. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Domi, and I'm from the Carlucci International American School of Lisbon. Okay. And I just wanted to say uh, we greatly appreciate you for coming, and we hope you come back again sometime soon. That's uh, nice of you. Something really important is that the Russia versus Ukraine war is having impacts on many types of people all, from all over the world. Yeah. And one thing in common between all these different... Sorry, I wasn't speaking into the mic earlier. Uh, one thing in common is youth. Youth is yeah. everywhere. And I was wondering, how do you think we, the youth, can help to maintain international security and to mitigate the impacts of the war? Yeah. Actually, that's a really good question. Do you want me to answer that? Maybe, maybe yes, and okay, then sure. I'll, I'll pick up Look, on Look, very, very <laughs> simply, if you look at voting patterns, right, um, in really important elections, there's been a very disturbing pattern of, of first-time voters not choosing not to vote, right? Um, and thereby depriving themselves and the and, and politics of of a you know a finger on the scales, right? So honestly, I mean, I know that this sounds possibly very banal, but bloody hell, go out and vote, right? Um, and and then there are of course ways in which you can have a more immediate impact, um, and it really starts with community engagement. I mean, I have vivid memories. I, fi I, I finished school in Madrid um, at the German school, and, and it was, uh, Franco was not long under the earth. So the mood at the school, particularly at the German school, where there are a lot of grandchildren of genuine old Nazis, uh, was quite authoritarian. And, and my quite left-wing um, German teacher put me up to running for, for class president, or rather for a school council, and we, we I, Plucked up, we plucked up all our courage and went to the director of the school and said, we would like to form a school council. And the director said, over my dead body, <laughs> and showed us the door. <laughs> so um, hopefully you're not in that situation. But I mean, frankly, it is worthwhile, and I'm being a little bit jokey here because it's late, but, but you know what I mean. You, you don't live in, in an autocracy. You have options, right? You have options to look at your community and to see where you could play a role, yeah, whether it's at your school whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's, I don't know, you know, cleaning up a public park. I'm sorry, these are very banal ideas, but there are ways in which um, one can actually practice negotiation uh, and diplomacy and, and, and getting, getting policy results. Um, I'm very serious about that. And because you're an American, I take it. Um, no? Sorry? I'm from Finland. From Finland, okay. Well, I mean, the Americans always tell you to run for office, right? Um, which is maybe perhaps a little bit, if you're still going to school, perhaps a bit early for that. But, um, but I, find that, I find that so encouraging when they say that, because I think it implies you know, that anybody, if they want to, you know, can sort of say, you know what, I have something to say, and do this. And, and interestingly enough, the, German, the current German legislature has more first-term 
um, first term legislators than, than ever before historically, and more people who I think, you know, younger, and, and they're younger than ever before. Um, and presumably they looked at the state of politics, politics and said, you know what, I don't like this, but if I don't like it, I, sh I need to go in and try and change it. And interestingly enough, some of them appear to be a lot more pragmatic and less ideological than older generations who were there for a very, very, very long time. So all I can say is go for it. So maybe we have time to, for two more questions. I'll, I'll try to look down uh, yeah. as much as possible. So maybe there and then maybe there. Uh, so younger voices and so yes. maybe there and then... Sorry, everybody who's older. You know, you're in my <laughs> category. Sorry about that. There. We're husbands. Yes, and then there, maybe there. So two younger voices and I'm sorry for all, all who were asking for the floor and I couldn't give it. Okay. Yeah, ladies first. Hi, uh, so my question is a bit different from the previous ones, I think. Um, it's about the China's rise. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know your opinion about the demographic crisis that China is facing right now. And how do you think this will have an impact in their uh, world domination they are facing mm -hmm. that right now? And yeah, that's it, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Great. And then the other one. Okay, hello. Yours was a great presentation. I'm going to go straight to my question. Um, there are many interesting questions, but uh, mine is about what do you think is the best case realistic scenario uh, related to Russia's war on Ukraine and uh, its relation to the West? Especially, how would you see Russia's reintegration into the international uh, institution? I know they're still in, but for example, um, the economy uh, to Olympic Games, etc. Because they can't, it's very, I don't think imagine a future, a future where they're a pariah right. forever. It's right. kind of strange. And also, in particular, with the West, is there a way back yes. in yeah. terms of some kind That's of. That's the question, thanks. So, I mean, look. Let me answer the China question first. Um, and, and I'm not a China expert, and I'm sort of profoundly aware of that, so I'm going to be careful. What I will say is that it seems to me that China's demographics are a vulnerability for its power, right? Because, they, because the, the, the demographics translate into an economic vulnerability, and that translates into a pol political vulnerability. And that may be a reason why Xi Jinping is so um, you know, focused on achieving a consolidation of power at the national and centralization level at this moment, yeah, because he sees the trajectory going downward. Yeah. It's possible that Putin made a similar calculation, right? Um, that doesn't make that kind of situation less risky, unfortunately. And I don't see the, that kind of demographics is actually very hard to change unless you accept you know, real immigration. And of course, you're now seeing in Europe um, discussions about labor immigration. We found, for example, that the, the Syrian migrant uh, who came to Germany in 2015, almost all of them integrated into, the labor, into, into a labor market that was desperate for, for new workers, right? And the same thing is true of many of the Ukrainians who've, who've come to Germany, right? So, I mean, and, and the problem is that I, I don't really see the Chinese ac accepting, accepting labor migration in any, in any serious way. I think that that would actually be a real sort of political uh, challenge and a, and a challenge for social cohesion. Now, we've learned how to do that, and nobody knows that better than the Portuguese who've been you know, mobile you know, for decades, and, and which is what makes you so cosmopolitan and so you know, multi-European because so many of you have, have now additional roots in other European countries or relatives who are there, right? And I think that that's a, a huge asset for a country you know, because you can learn from each other and from different places, right? But I'm, I think that, that in that sense, the, the Chinese are more brittle. Now, on, on your question of reintegrating Russia, um, you know, I think we're, we're agreed on that that would be good, right? But the problem is, you know, the circumstances. I think we, we are probably agreed that we, that we can't accept Russia just going on, you know, slaughtering its neighbors when it, when it de decides to do so, right? Um, and we are probably agreed that a Russia that is run by a small group of kleptocrats you know, 
is not likely to be a Russia that behaves well externally. Right? So I go back to what I said earlier, until Russia abandons its new imperial ambitions and, un and probably until it learns how to govern itself differently, I find it hard to imagine a return to pre-war relations with Russia. Yeah? I mean, I could see us having sort of, you know, the, bar the barely necessary communications um, on issues that are, you know, sort of of an emergency quality. Yeah? Say if there were some kind of a, uh, an international emergency. Yeah? And then you say, okay, I'm going to hold my nose and pick up the phone. But I, I, don't see, I don't see, you know, sort of real negotiations with the Russians on climate because nobody can forget what they've done to the, to the Ukrainians, right? I mean, I re let me give you an example from my own experience. When I was at my, my newspaper, Die Zeit, and, and uh, covering Balkans war crimes tribunals, we had huge controversial debates about the, out the, uh, the final end state of the Balkans wars, right? And when people like me said, you know, there has to be some justice for the war crimes committed, um, then some of our older colleagues would say, oh, you know, you're a bleeding heart liberal. Uh, what we need is a negotiated peace, and then all that can be forgotten because all the sides committed war crimes, right? And then some of us would said, well, you know, arguably that some of that happened in Germany, yeah, because of a lot of, lot of Nazis actually escaped prosecution, and frankly, that poisoned German politics for, for decades. Yeah? And, um, you know, how do you know that that won't happen in the Balkans, right? Um, and in the Balkans, of course, you had, you had three, three actors, the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosniaks, who had different levels of ability to do bad things to each other, but all three of them tried. And I'm quoting a Bosniak here, whom I, I traveled with. Um, whereas here, you have sort of a startlingly obvious you know, act of you know, violation of the international prohibition of aggression by a great power, a nuclear great power, against a, a neighbor and former partner uh, that gave up its nuclear weapons um, as a result of an international negotiation. An agreement um, in which Russia recognized the, the integrity of the borders the of Ukraine. The integrity of the borders of Ukraine, the, precisely. The yeah. Budapest Memorandum. Exactly. And so, honestly, I, I think in this case, the violation of foundational international norms has been so egregious that I, 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 I lack the imagination to see how we could just, you know, pass over that and say, let bygones be bygones, and, you know, come visit us at the Elysee. I, you know, yeah. maybe that's my failure of imagination, but I don't see it. Well, on that uh, cheerful note. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'll I'll just uh, add one note uh, in line with what you were saying, which I think is very important. It, it, we we sometimes uh, uh, and underrate ourselves and overrate our adversaries. Mm -hmm. Let's say. Yeah. So I do think that uh, democracy has has many weaknesses, but. Uh, it has this big advantage, at least as we understand it in, in Europe, which is this kind of uh, uh, democracy as pluralism, as uh, uh, counterbalances, as a constitutional democracy. It, it's, it doesn't claim to be perfect, uh, and therefore it's open for criticism, for change, for perfectibility, and I think mm -hmm. in that respect authoritarian regimes are, uh, have a, have a, are much weaker and have yeah. a much more difficult and time more adapting. But uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk, for the q and I'm sorry for those of you I, I could not give the floor to, but I think uh, that also shows that not only you very, very kindly said you, were, you would be willing to come back, but clearly you have an audience which is eager to ask more questions, so that's another okay. reason to, to come let's, back. So let's thank you very much. Let, let's hope we're not talking about something much more horrible next year. So yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.